the very roots of eating, of negativity and singularity, including the ultimate form of singularity, which is the whole state of things, a pure violence without object anymore. This is the typical violence of Violence because what happens there is a murder of the real, the vanishing point of reality. Let's not have a misunderstanding here. Welcome to this week's edition of Machinic Unconscious Happy Hour with Cooper Cherry and Taylor Atkins. As always, sponsored by the People's Institute for Revolutionary Semiotics. Before we introduce our guest today, just want to mention that we have a Patreon at patreon.com forward slash M-U-H-H. Consider throwing us a buck a month there to support the show, or if not, perhaps leave us a nice review on iTunes. But uh, Taylor and I are very excited to bring you Eric Santner, Chair of the Department of Modern Germanic Studies at the University of Chicago, author of works examining psychoanalysis, literature, and philosophy, including two that we're going to focus on our discussion on today, My Own Private Germany, Daniel Paul Schraber's Secret History of Modernity, and untying things together, philosophy, literature, and a life in theory. Eric, thanks so much for joining us on the happy hour. Yeah, it's great to be here. Although I, I don't have uh, I don't have a drink, and it's, it's, it's a bit it would count as day drinking. Yeah, yeah, that's, it's five o'clock sometime, right? It's happy hour somewhere, and we do like to think about our. It's like the cohort after the conference, right? The right, but that's where the serious thinking goes on, and uh, and it's, it's camaraderie, it's sharing, it's you're able to let your hair down, if you will, and it's really nice to get your thoughts already sort of percolating in our pre show, right? Because it's obviously that you are still excited by theory. And, and I, I love this, uh, this subtitle, uh, because it really does come out in the work, this notion of a, of a life in theory. It almost reminds me of Deleuze's work, Eminence of Life, right? There's this sense mm -hmm. of a continued enjoyment. And one of the things that we do like to do starting off is kind of asking about sort of anecdotal background of how one gets into theory, philosophy, whatever it is. And you detail a lot of that story in the opening chapters of Untying Things Together. But I was wondering, just as a way of familiarizing our audience and sort of enticing them to, to pick up a copy and read your own thoughts, if you had perhaps a longer or shorter version, or maybe an extra anecdote that didn't make it into the work about your sort of getting into theory. And as like an extra prompt, I was thinking about your footnote about, you asked the rhetorical question, what if I hadn't taken the subway with Richard Schulman that day? And this incitement to learn German and become fluent and read, uh, read German literature, philosophy, theory in its original language. So just to start us off, I'd like to hear a little bit about how you sort of got bitten by the theory bug, or as you say, you were kind of resistant at first. Tell us just a little bit about that experience. There are different stories one tells oneself, you know, about how one came to do what one does, be the person one is. And the story I tell in Untying Things Together focuses a lot on contingencies. Yes. Um, which, you know, and lucky encounters. And that's all true. But I know also there is there is a sense that, you know, I mean, I was a total OCD kid. I, mm -hmm. you know, my parents sent me to a, psych a, a psychoanalyst when I was an adolescent. Interesting. I, he had, you know, I was not a, you know, I was, a, I was preoccupied with something without knowing what it was and, and that I was somehow working out symptomatically, but also converting into intellectual labors of very, yeah. and I went to this high school that was very focused on the sciences, the Bronx High School of Science. And even though I did not do all the, you know, the AP classes, I did think I would be a math and physics person. Yes, you mentioned that. I mean, I got into some Ivy Leagues, but I chose to go to Oberlin. And there was clearly a sense that Oberlin is a kind of choice, you know, it, it has a music conservatory, I played cello mm -hmm. at the time. So there was a sense that I wanted math and physics, but I knew that somehow that would not be where I would work out. 
Interesting. You know, what was bugging me. But I also then realized that I didn't have this, you know, this great talent for, <laughs> for, for mathematics, which, and I took an intro to philosophy class with a really wonderful philosopher who had studied with Karsten Harries at Yale, was in the phenomenological tradition. He never finished his dissertation on Husserl, didn't get tenure at Oberlin, but he was my mentor. Yeah. And it was because of him that I got interested. He basically infected me with a philosophy bug. But I had worked on French. I took French all through high school. But then, okay. you know, as I tell this anecdote, I was, you know, the after freshman year and, you know, in the summer, I was going to, uh, you know, to the city to hang out in Central Park with my friend, Richie Shulman from the neighborhood. And he had been interested in linguistics. And he said, oh, you're doing, you're interested in philosophy. You have to learn German. I thought, yes. really? I, I really hadn't thought much about it. Excellent. And I started German. And then I really took to it. And I then continued working with Tom Trelogan, this philosopher who was had become my mentor. And he then introduced me to the world of, of you know, basically phenomenology, you know, Husserl and Heidegger. Then I immediately applied to study in Germany. I ended mm -hmm. up at the University of Bonn, which was a center for Kant studies. So I got really into Kant. But I also took, it was 1976, I took a seminar on being in time. And that was also the, the spring of 76 is when Heidegger died. And I remember in the seminar, we all had to stand up and observe. A, 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 <laughs> you a, mentioned a this, yeah. Silence, yeah. So I read Being in Time for the first time. And, you know, it really kind of, you know, knocked me over. And yes, I knew that this was kind of my guy. And I went back to Oberlin and, and did a senior thesis on being in time. Or, Which you or, sadly don't have anymore, you said, right? You, you, you don't have a copy of it somehow. I remember driving with a friend to Penn State where there was a conference on Heidegger. And I tried to give it to Albert Hofstetter, who was a translator of the late Heidegger. And he kind of, you know, as I understand now... <laughs> It's like this, you know, this 21 year old is giving you this long thing written in German. I wrote it right, in German. Right, right. Kind of said thanks, but no thanks. Yeah. Anyway, but I had already got a Fulbright to go to Germany and to work on Heidegger. And that's what I did after I graduated Oberlin and had a kind of nervous breakdown when I was in Freiburg. And, you know, clearly for many personal reasons, my father had died. Yes, you mentioned that. I didn't, they, were, they were just, you know, clearly a lot going on in my life, but I tried to hold on to, in a certain sense, my sanity through philosophy. And I realized that was exacerbating things. I mean, it was encouraging the sort of intellectualizations that sort of give you a sense of mastery, but I realized that that was really not the case. Interesting. And I decided at that point I needed a break from philosophy, but I had become fluent in German. And I had met some people, who, you know, who were getting their degrees from Austin, Texas, from UT Austin. They told me about this amazing place. You know, this was, you know, um, 77, 78, mm -hmm. which was also the year of, you know, the big terrorism year in Germany when the Bader meinhof group. Was, oh, OK. Yes. You know, German autumn. And I just out of, uh, you know, I just decided, OK, I'll apply to UT Austin I, in German because I yeah. thought I could I could be a TA in German. and you know, in the meantime, figure out what happened, you know, what this breakdown was about. How, in a certain sense, the life of the mind was not working for me the way I, in the way I had imagined it would. And then I decided to stay with literature. Yeah. That literature was a kind of, um, it allowed me to stay in touch with the kind of ideas that I got excited about in Heidegger but it allowed me to do so in a less pure, less abstract way, a more, yes. you know, basically in a way that felt more fleshed out. Yeah, yeah. I like how you say that. Yeah. So stories, rhetoric, poetic language, basically, you know, it was a shift, let's say, from spirit to letter. And I found that the, the shift from spirit to letter also, I realized that the flesh has to do to some extent, with the letter getting under the skin. So in a certain sense, I, I was finding my way back to the life of the mind, but through the agitated body. Anyway, I continued working on Heidegger with the philosophy people, the few philosophy people who were interested in that sort of thing at UT Austin. 
the main people I worked with, you know, are all dead now. Charlie Guignon, Louis Mackey, Bob Solomon were the main people there. That was also the moment when deconstruction and post-structuralism really hit the fan. Gayatri Spivak had recently been appointed at UT Austin. That, I found that interesting. Grammatology yeah. had just come out. Mm -hmm. um, everyone, no matter what department you were in, social sciences, humanities, everyone was basically reading the same sets of books. It was kind of the high theory moment, and it was very heady, and, and it also gave a sense of, of real community across the discipline. So it was profoundly interdisciplinary or post-disciplinary, yes. which I really like. But that then made it very strange for me to be in a, a department of Germanic studies where I felt I had to be responsible for the, you know, German literary history, for all yes. these things that were, you know, highly discipl you know, disciplinary. And I've never actually lost that problem, always being, you know, being responsible for a canon, responsible for, you know, as a, a teacher in the discipline, but ultimately always, you know, knowing that my interests are, I came up with, you know, the crucial ideas in that tradition, in that language, but they were not limited to that. And so that's, you know, a lot of people were feeling the same thing. And departments that used to be called departments of Germanic languages and literatures all switched to being departments of German studies. Interesting. Which that that just that just that little shift. So right. you could basically do media theory, psychoanalysis, all kinds of stuff, and still be in a department. But of course, that was what was lamented by a lot of people who were the dedicated. traditionalists, yeah. right? And it had to do with, you know, struggles over the canon. And anyway, so that's when I kind of, when I came up in literary studies, in German literary studies. And what I just insert here, and, and one of the things that I think was interesting, because you do even mention it in passing, is that whether or not due to your sort of needing to take a break from philosophy, but this continued with your dissertation, which was not, say, on Heidegger, but on on Holderlin, right? right? And I think that, that that is kind of an interesting, um, maybe culmination of your, you know, what is it? The As you said, the letting the, going from the spirit to the letter, letting the letter get under your skin, the, the more embodied sort of poetic from the pure, like Dinkin to, to Dicton or something like that, right? Yeah. You know, this change. And what, what I also found fascinating was your mention of Jean Laplanche, because yeah. it seemed like in your narrative, if I'm understanding you, before you really sort of got into Freud, you were you were intimate with some of the works of Jean Laplanche, basically yeah. also with his work on Holderlin. You want to say a little yeah. bit about that and and, yeah. and and the enigmatic signifiers, right? Yeah. This is this is where my ears perked up. I never studied, I never took a course in psycho in anything having to do with psychoanalysis. I never I never read Freud at Oberlin. I don't think I read Freud at UT Austin. I know I joined a group that was trying to make sense of Lacan, but I was reading Lacan before <laughs> I really, I really knew Freud. And I right, it incredibly difficult, way yes. too difficult. And so I, I just kept up there. This is not for me. I mean, I've had that with a, num a number of writers where I just say this is not for me, and I ended up getting, you know, after many years, then finding my, my way back to them. That's the um, fail, the with, fail better moment, right? Yeah, the <laughs> but in Heidegger, it was I felt immediately at. at I felt that he he was a, a thinker I felt at home with right away, and it was always gotcha. later I felt deeply alienated. Yes, <laughs> from his thought but for I, different I, reasons. For different <laughs> reasons. But, yeah. I then, but I then came came back to it and still you know and still read it. But Laplanche, I mean, in the course of working on Hölderlin, and I came on this upon this book, you know, Hölderlin um, and the question of the father which was not in, in English at the time, but it was you know, available in French. And there was already a German translation. Interesting. I, well, that I makes never sense. Heard of, I never heard of Laplanche. I never, I mean, I had just heard of Lacan. So I, I think it's a great book about Hölderlin. It's about mm -hmm. Hölderlin's breakdown, focused mostly on the period in you know, the 1790s when he encountered Fichte. In a certain sense, he struggled with the risks to the mind that yes, that kind of philosophy, basically a kind of absolute idealism represents. Mm. It's seductive. It's because it promises a kind of conceptual mastery, but it also, Hölderlin felt repelled by it. And he fled Jena. That's what Laplanche focused on. But in the course of his, his 
interpretation, he cited his teacher, Lacan, and in particular Lacan's work on Schreber. Now the dots are connecting. I see. And and that was also he that book was written before Lacan had the notion of enigmatic signifier. But it was focused on the paternal metaphor, on the name of the father, and Lacan's theory of psychosis as a foreclosure of this master signifier. That Hoderlin was in a way came to experience language almost corporeally. And uh, anyway, so without realizing it, Lacan had, you know, was planted and Schreber was planted. I didn't pursue those. I mean, they were in a way names. They were embedded like those yeah. enigmatic signifiers in the unconscious. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, and it took many years for me to, to get back to that stuff. But working on Hoderling was so crucial for me. Because, I mean, just working really closely with poetic language and with the poet who was breaking down, <laughs> having um, a psychotic mm-hmm. break and at the point where his poetry, I think, was most exciting. That was also the beginning of a preoccupation with sort of language at the point of breakdown. So in a way, the linguistic turn for me took place in the context of an engagement with the poet whose relation to language had become profoundly precarious was, you know, kind of, I was actually just rereading Walter Benjamin's essay on the task of the translator. And he talks about Hoderlin's late translations of Sophocles. And he talks about the translators always being at the risk of falling into an abyss at the edge of meaningful language, at the edge of communicative (laughs) language. And I was feeling that in Germany, you know, Mm -hmm. and clearly I gravitated to Hoderlin, and then I gravitated to Schreber. So yes. I was gravitating to, you know, people prone to, you know, psychotic breaks, and that manifested themselves around language. Schreber makes perfect sense in this context, specifically with this, the way you kind of describe it, talking about the task of the translator essay is this sort of attentiveness, the sensitivity to this surplus signification right. in the act of translation that can be overwhelming. And there's something about Schreber and his breakdown, which has to do with a whole host of different aspects, many of which that you brought to light for me for the first time. And I think for Cooper, because we have discussed the Schreber case in many different details, but one of the things that is so key to your reading and so compelling is this notion of a crisis of investiture, right? This crisis of sort of not being or being too close, too overly proximate to to the sort of whether we call it like the law or this symbolic status as the Senate president, right? I wanted to step back just a minute because I know for Cooper, this is like one of our favorite things to discuss. So I definitely want to let my colleague jump in if we're going to talk a little bit about Schreber. Can I just say for Schreber, I mean, there too, Schreber for me was, I was working on Schreber when I was going through the tenure process. And so yes. uh, an extended process of investiture, you know, would it happen or would it not happen? And I ended up getting tenure at Princeton and realized that the investiture with tenure was, I found was not simply a happy experience. Interesting. It was stressful, but there was something, I understood something about Schreber, that Schreber being appointed to this position of great authority, he was authorized. He enjoyed a kind of legitimacy and authority. You know, he was in a way invited to speak from this position within a symbolic system and he couldn't inhabit the office. In a way, he couldn't be the officer. Yes. Couldn't fully respond to the call of the office. And the call itself became like a a kind of an experience of paranoia of being and then being assaulted by by agents of institutional authority, you know, including his the family, the family, the law, psychiatric institutions, Mm -hmm. and so on. But investiture the i mean today everyone knows about investiture crisis through the popular term imposter syndrome that's become a kind of a commonplace you know so the idea of fake it until you make it you know this idea <laughs> that it's almost assumed that we don't fully identify with the symbolic positions we inhabit who really you know who am i and you know my they don't want to really be parental authorities so there's a problem teachers are you know are uncomfortable so there's a sense that 
inhabiting these offices, these symbolic offices have become profoundly difficult. Schreber was kind of, is a kind of a laboratory for exploring the complexities and the, the profound difficulties of, in a way, of transforming your symbolic status and metabolizing it, making yes. it its own, owning, you know, what that means. I'm always impressed with people who seem to identify with their office. Right. It's as if they, they are that. They mm-hmm. don't, it's as if they don't, you know, how come you think you're a professor? I know you're a professor, but how come you believe it? (laughs) It's a special kind of madness, like the joke that Lacan tells about the madman who thinks he's king versus the king who thinks he's king. And there's there's really no difference there, except for a a kind of well-adjusted madness, if you will. Exactly, yeah. And in a certain sense, you know, I think, I I mean, the subtitle is, you know, Daniel Paul Schraver's Secret History of Modernity. Yes. That investiture crisis is a kind of a, um, a path into a number of other aspects of the crises of modernity. And Schreber himself kind of used his own breakdown as a way of gathering various political and cultural phenomena, bringing them into a kind of a network of relations that were delusional, but incredibly, um, but they made a lot of sense. They made a lot of sense. Yes, exactly. They, They weren't merely nonsense. This actually just came to mind. I was thinking about, and I don't know if you get into this in the Schreber book so much as the new book where you have these discussions of of Paul, the Apostle Paul. But I was just thinking that's a very interesting connection between Schreber and Paul in the way that the son and this sort of conversion moment occurs to them both. Because at the one sort of interesting fact about Schreber's memoir is that he it wasn't intended to be this sort of landmark publication in terms of psychoanalysis, but what he sought to do was to have this be for religious and occult scholars, which yeah. I think is a fascinating. So I think before his psychosis or whatever you want to describe it as, he was sort of this atheist more or less. And then he became mm-hmm. a sort of of a believer. This was like his his road to Damascus was this right. sort of ordeal that he experienced, which I think is quite interesting given to, you know. I guess the the primal father yeah. notions of God, Moses and monotheism, like this is yeah. all sort of wrapped up in, in these ordeal, discussions of Schreber. His ordeal begins with an experience that God is not living up to his office. Right. That God is failing to be God. Crisis of investiture. Exactly. Yeah. So God was failing to live up to, in a way, his his office as deity. And what Schreber was experiencing was a default in the other, in the big other. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So <clears throat> he was experiencing that he had absorbed, taken into you know his body a crisis that was out there. Right. Yeah. The, the and, crisis of modernity, and then you know obviously Fleshig represents this with his. I thought this was an interesting anecdote too, the way that Fleshig preferred to work with after the body had passed away, so we could yeah. d- dissect, and the way that God. See, this is one of the ideas that's really tremendously grip my imagination is that Schreber's God doesn't understand the living. He only right. understands corpses, which I think gives it this whole Lovecraftian sort of element to it, which is, I think, just extremely fascinating. But because, in a certain sense, the what happens is that because God only deals with corpses, he doesn't understand yes. living human beings. And so when he gets involved with living human beings, he gets too close. And so in a certain sense, the transgressor is God. The mm-hmm. transgressor, but the trans the original transgressor, I think, is the father, his own father. Mm-hmm. Yes. Really, this, you know, this orthopedic, this, you know, an early experimenter in orthopedic manipulations and you know, apparatuses. He was also a public health authority, you know. I mean, the Schreber Gardens in Germany were named after him. He didn't invent them, but he was right. Very famous. I mean, he was interested in exercise. He wrote books, you know, this great book about, you know, it's an exercise book on using one apparatus. You know, um, I think it's a dumbbell. Today, we would think of it as, you know, progressive. And in fact, it was thought of as progressive. He was interested in health, but his interest in health was seen as an interest in, in a certain sense, I want to say the discipline of the body was taking the place of, let's say, it became a mode of some of paternal authority. And so that's where Foucault came in for me. There was a a shift in a mode of authority 
from, let's say, symbolic authority of the father to a kind of disciplinary biopolitical authority of, at first, a, a doctor in public health, you know, expert in the father, and then in Flexic, whose inaugural address, you know, when he became professor was entitled Gehirn und Seele, Brain and Soul. And he said, Brain and Soul, yeah. The age of the soul is over, the age of the brain begins. Interesting. The idea that you could actually, that, you know, psychic disturbances, mental illness, you know, are ultimately about the brain. So he's an early, you know, neuroscientist in a way. But at that point, to be a neuroscientist, you basically had to dissect brain. You know, you couldn't scan brains. (laughs) And he did, you know, he made discoveries about the myelinization of of neurons. And Freud knew his work. This was one, I believe it might have been in a footnote, again, going back to the (laughs) the Ibn and economy that that I so love. But you mentioned this notion that Freud was familiar with Flex's work and was... Was it a letter that he wrote to his wife mentioning that he saw Flexig as a potential rival because of Freud's early interest in this sort of neuro- neurological understanding? You know, of- I don't remember exactly where Freud wrote about Flexig, but he was pretty well known. Interesting. Okay. But the other aspect, the other, let's say, Foucauldian dimension was in, mm-hmm. came out through the psychiatrist at the Sonnenstein Asylum, who was basically a, who was, Weber, yeah Weber, who was a largely a forensic psychiatrist. And, okay, okay, yes. So that point in which you know, in which medical knowledge becomes converges with legal authority. Yes, the juridical um, medical yes. discipline. Yes, Schreber, in a certain sense, knew, without knowing exactly how he knew, <laughs> that there was something amiss with his father's mode of being a father, Lexic's mode of being a healer of mental illness, and Weber's, you know, a contamination of medical care with legal judgment. Yes, because Weber's the one that keeps him in asylum for years yeah. on end yeah. when, when Schreber is trying to argue, he has to take up his own case eventually, right? Exactly. And, ar- and argue for his delusions not being harmful to himself or to others and being right. able to handle his uh, his financial affairs as a kind of a criterion of rationality. Yeah. And he basically <clears throat> says, the state has no interest in my body. <laughs> yes. You know, the state should not be interested in my mental health if I'm not endangering myself or others. But for him, mental health had mutated into, you know, a religion. And as you say, he was, you know, as Cooper said, that he <sighs> actually wondered who the who the best audience would be for his memoir, and he came to think that it was really basically philosophers and theologians, people interested in religion, not people interested in mental illness. Um, Interest, yeah. So the question of like, you know, the the genre of the book, and even though he included, you know, the manuscript as part of the evidence in the trial adjudicated his, his release from the asylum, and as full of delusions as it were, the court respected that this was in a way a private religion. But it was a religion built out of and on the fragments of a failure of a, a traditional kind of master, a traditional kind of paternal authority. Lacan characterized as the foreclosure of the name of the father, or was basically saying this was a broad cultural you know, phenomenon and even cosmic. He understood it in yes. his own flesh. And his experience became a crucial resource for the world to to grasp what the stakes are when, in a certain sense, the name of the father collapses, you know, and you could say the end of patriarchy. You know, he was registering kind of the demise of patriarchy and the consequences, the ramifications of that for all institutions in which with which he was familiar this is interesting because it resonates with uh, another thread that you brought out and made salient, which I thought was um, fascinating, which is this notion that at the time Freud, I think in the preface to his, his case study of the memoirs, he kind of admits he had kind of put it off. It had been almost a decade since the publication of Schreber's autobiography, if you want to call it that. And and you identify that Freud's undertaking of Schreber has not only an element of identification 
going on in various elements, but more specifically, the there is potentially at least on the rise, if not already incipiently, there is this crisis of the institution of psychoanalysis itself. Yeah. And that to me was a fascinating way of sort of pinpointing how Freud could, and I'm kind of dovetailing two different questions here. So that's that one aspect where Freud is, is trying to um, legitimate this crisis of institution that Schraber is already kind of detailing on the one hand and ward off those crises from within uh, in psychoanalysis, which he starts to do very much so till the end of his life is trying to secure a future for it. But the other part too, which I always found fascinating, which you shed a lot of light on, was in Anti-Oedipus to Liz and Guattari kind of point out that what's missing from Freud's case study pretty blatantly is any mention of the racial and at times racist aspects of Schraber's delusions. And that you provide all kinds of interesting arguments to, to sort of point out what Freud was perhaps, if not repressing, warding off in his own way and not dealing with that very clear and salient point throughout the, the memoirs of this sort of racial dynamic and the delusions. There are a number of different layers to what you just said. First, the paradox of the institution of psychoanalysis is that I think psychoanalysis, and that's, I think, what the Schraber material helps us see, that psychoanalysis is ultimately not about Oedipus, about the failure of Oedipus. You know, mm, yes. psychoanalysis is born when the Oedipal father is, has already died. <laughs> uh, in a way, the owl of Minerva has, has flown right. on the Oedipal father. And that's the point when Freud elaborates the notion of the Oedipal complex. And so psychoanalysis is ultimately a study of the mind torn up by not just a failure to metabolize authority, but a mind's encounter with a broad social failure, a social crisis, a crisis right. of authority in society. So it's not, in a way, it's not, it's not happening just in your mind. It's happening out there, and your mind is metabolizing what's happening out there. So psychoanalysis is not about the failure of a, of a subject to, in a certain sense, internalize authorities, but the failure of authorities to be authorities, and in a certain sense, the kind of openness, but also anxiety you know, that that signals. But how, you cre how do you create an institution, an institutional authority, around the theory of failed authority? and in a way, endemically failing, a chronically failing authority. And so the, the whole problem of the authority of psychoanalysis, in a way, psychoanalysis can't, in a way, can't fully institutionalize because it's, it's about, the, in a way, the collapse of institutions and the way, the way human lives metabolize that. And so Freud, I think, is there's this constant struggle with that. Now, with respect to, let's say, the racial, you know, ethnic dimensions of his thinking and his life, I mean, Schreber, the part that of the Schreber case that Freud never touches mm -hmm. is Schreber's identification with the wandering Jew. And I think it's really important for understanding the case. But also Freud's theory ultimately was one of that Schreber was lived a kind of homosexual panic, was defending against it. So he was failing to be, in a certain sense, failing to manage his own homosexual feelings and to consolidate a heterosexual identity, to be a father, although he did adopt a child you know, yes. after he was released from the asylum, though his daughter later said his father was more of a mother to him than her mother. By then, Schreiber had already become a kind of feminized wandering Jew. So basically, his daughter had a Jewish mother, <laughs> not, <laughs> not, a, not a Lutheran. <laughs> but there's a lot of work that's been done around Freud's you know, relation to Judaism some mm -hmm. of it is purely, let's say, is largely just cultural history. Part of what Freud, what led Freud to, you know, to avoid, I think, touching on the Jewish question in Schreber was the preoccupation that psychoanalysis would be thought of as a Jewish science. As a Jewish science, right. Yeah. So he was preoccupied with the authority, with the scientific authority yes. of its new science. He was trying to establish a new science, the credentials of a new science. And this is partly why he cultivated Jung as his yep. successor. And it was actually Jung who turned him on to Schreber. Jung knew the material before Freud and turned him on to it. And Jung probably learned about it from Otto Gross, who was 
kind of a radical, you know, psychoanalytic thinker whose father had been one of Kafka's law professors. I mean, it's a very complicated story. And interesting. His Uh father had his son auto institutionalized. There was a real struggle there, but Gross turned Jung onto it and Jung turned Freud onto it. So he didn't want to be, he didn't want psychoanalysis to be thought of a Jewish science. So he had to, he felt he had to keep a distance from this. But Daniel Boyarin and Sandra Gilman are two of the of the scholars who did a lot of work around the right. trips around Jewish masculinity in yes. you know in fantasy Central Europe and the preoccupation with the thought that Jewish men are in some sense not really men. So you know the way Daniel Boyarin put it, one of the Dreyfus trial was. The Oscar Wilde trial was equally important as the as the the Dreyfus trial. Interesting um, that this anxiety about being perceived as effeminate, in a way, not heteronormative, right? Subjects, and so Freud kind of displaced. This is the thought that Freud displaced his own anxiety about being perceived that way, largely onto women. And I, I found that very compelling. And 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 amidst this story, just to we can come back to the implications of what you just mentioned, but to get back to this question of anxiety influence, which you also bring out, and which I think informs some of the idea behind an ibidinal economy, the way in which there is, uh, in Freud, you see it throughout his life, that not only in the publication in the moment where footnotes are doing so much of the heavy lifting in terms of progeny of ideas, who came up with what, but even, even in the body of the text against Jung, and there is this there's this whole, I forget the the word that Freud keeps trying to put forward to, maybe I think of the Wolfman case, but he's he's trying to, uh, instead of schizophrenia, there, um, some other term that I'm now failing to remember, but, but sort of way in which Freud wants to keep it from being considered mainly a, a Jewish science and yet also argue about who came up with which idea and who's the father of the idea. There is, there is the still struggle of authority, very central to a lot of Freud's work, especially in the case studies. Yeah. And again, it's the problem of authority with respect to a new science that's about the demise of traditional forms of authority. So it sort of folds in on itself. <laughs> yeah. But the other aspect I think of that actually came to interest me more about mm-hmm. Judaism was not a defensive posture with respect to the way Jews were perceived and represented. That is the Jew in the gaze of the other, you know, sort of the um, black skin, white masks, you know, kind of, or the, or Sartre's anti-Semite and Jew kind of, you know, that it's the other's gaze that gets under your skin. Interesting, yeah. Um, And that Freud is kind of, you know, defending against that. I think what started interesting me was something that becomes very clear in Moses and monotheism. Mm -hmm. And his own statement, when he says in the preface to the Hebrew edition of Totem and Taboo that he doesn't, you know, he's not religious, he has no national identification, he's not a Zionist, he doesn't know the ancient languages, he doesn't know, and yet he feels that in his deepest essence he's a Jew, but right. doesn't, and one day science might understand what that means. And I think Moses and monotheism was in a certain sense attempt to, to be that science that right. um, identifies that, but it has something to do with what I develop through readings of Gershom Sholem and Walter Benjamin's correspondence about Kafka. Yes. When they were talking about, when they, they were trying to figure out the theological dimensions of Kafka's work, particularly the Jewish the theological dimensions of Kafka's work, they came up with this thought, and Sholem was the one who coined the phrase, they came up with this thought of a kind of a revelation reduced to a kind of zero level. Interesting. Um, that is revelation, as they put it, uh, the way Shalom put it, that is valid, but is meaningless. Hmm. That is still valid, and yet has lost its meaning. So is this radical attenuation of religious, traditional religious authority, and yet you still feel addressed. And so, in a certain sense, religious authority and the tradition becomes reduced to something like a pure address, <laughs> which you could say is hearing voices. But in a way, being touched by the, you know, the force of a voice without content. Mm. So there's a kind of impact with religious authority, but without a, a form of life with which you could then identify and live, you know, where that impact could be ramified. 
and integrate it into a way of life. Mm -hmm. And so in a certain sense, I think that's partly what Schreber also experienced, authority that was just the pure impact of, right. of authority that was but, as, as physical. And so because it had lost its, it was valid, but had lost its meaning, like bomb, being bombarded by, <laughs> by voices. This is that scene that you recount in detail where he is, he has the encounter with God, or at least Ariman, the lower God, right. in full, and he's impacted by this bass voice that calls him wretch, or as you as right. you go through it, you go through it very nicely, and this gets back to kind of translation and this right. excess of meaning, Luder. Do you right. want to say like a word about this and how that kind of informs this reading of getting under the skin because it, it it is almost this master signifier, or at least it it's a quilting point, right? Of all these different this network. Except it doesn't function that way for him in a way. It basically for him, it actually gets under his skin. It penetrates his body. So the interpolation, which is an insult, you know, you tart, you wretch, you know, you whore, you slut. So it's a carrying, yeah, carrying you rotten piece of flesh. And so his response to it is in a certain sense to be transformed into what it names. Right. So it's not that it's meaningful, it's that it works on him. So in a desiring way, machine, it's, it's yeah, not about it's what it means. It's it, yeah, go ahead. Sorry. So it's so in a certain sense, it doesn't exactly mean something for him, it does something to him. Yes, gotcha. Um, and through it's doing something to him, he's able to, in a certain sense, grasp something about the phenomenon of interpolation because of its, in a way, it's not fully working. He grasps the way that not fully working is always at work yeah. when it does work. Interesting. <laughs> when it is operative, that is, you get seized by an address in a certain sense, not because it just, you know, it works, but because you're stuck with you know, what do you want from me? What is, in a certain sense? Mm -hmm. And so it, the way the guy who wrote Crowds in Power. Kennedy. Uh, yeah, Kennedy. The way Elias Kennedy talks about an order as a thorn that gets under your Right, skin right, right, right. That, that never leaves. So it's a kind of, it's literally a trauma. Traumatic. That, th that you're kind of, that you're always trying to elaborate. Schreber's experience of being addressed as looter that actually starts to transform him into rotted flesh and, you know, wretch and prostitute, you know, God's mistress, God's. Hope. Yes. In a way that is kind of a, a radical, that's a delusional experience of the enigmatic signifier. Yeah. And, it, and like you said, it gets under the skin and it embeds and it forms a kind of constellation that he himself cannot read. It's almost too close to him. And again, to this over proximity, right. The way that, that you unpack it and work through it, because there are even more dimensions that we didn't get to, but that's okay. It's just that extimate thorn in his side. If right. you will. So again, it's like Traber allows us to, in a certain sense, it's like he doesn't, because he, because he experiences, let's say, what the neurotic experiences at the level of unconscious elaboration, he experiences at the level of delusional elaboration. Right. And he's basically quite articulate about it. So it's as if, and this is kind of what Freud noticed, that he is able to see <coughs> his own mind. He's able to, in a way, perceive unconscious mental activity because nothing is hidden. And he said that's why he didn't have to meet Schreber. Everything is there in the memoir. That is interesting, though, that he's not working with... This is a case study that kind of stands out. I mean, there are a few that to kind of break the norm for Freud. Little Hans is another one, right? right? Working with a child, but working with, one could say, the dead letter, you know, of if you want to bring back in this question of uh, Schreber's God, whatever, but Freud not working with a patient in front of him. So the, the question of the evenly suspended hovering attention is kind of called into question with how Freud tries to string together a coherent narrative that sometimes kind of falls in on itself, as you already mentioned. But yeah, I, all of this is is interesting. And it, you know, the, I like the reading you give, for example, of the birds, instead of them, you know, Freud wants to kind of, again, get back into this, this edible dimension or this mythological right. dimension, but you, you bring it out again, in terms in which you've kind of already discussed, that was just one of the things off the top of my head, but I'm rambling. This is, it's, I'm just, no, I'm excited. I'm excited. Yeah. In a certain sense, the birds, the nonsense, the chatter, the Twitter, mm -hmm. 
is a kind of it's like he's experiencing a kind of the materiality of signification that agitates that in a way acts directly on the nerves and at some level it's like he's able to note i would say the 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 um he's able to sort of he notices observes as it were the the material dimension of signification and communication so it, he develops almost a kind of media theory yeah. that has to do with energy force impacts you know bodies the touching of bodies by signifiers so there's a, a materialism but it's a materialism that he thinks has profound theological significance he says he's not a materialist so again i would say he's a sarxist he may not believe himself to be materialist but his method has materialist sarxist materialist aspects because one of the things you bring out is how he describes his method of sort of conquering these overpowering voices, memorizing poetry. And it doesn't matter what the right. poetry means. He just recites it sort of silently in his head, but it's a way of sort of working through that has nothing to do with the sensicality of it. It right. is this sort of mechanical working through of the materiality of the letter, which is why I sort of wanted to link this to your notion of a science of the flesh, which you also describe as Sarxist materialism. And you kind of mentioned this persistence in your writing of the relation between representations and nerves. And I think that's that's right. one of those key things that gets us back to sort of the relation with Freud and Flexig and the myelinization of the nerves and the, the interest in the uh, and the neuronal theory of Freud's postscript. So yeah, this would you still talk about it in these terms, this relation of the of representations and nerves, or is that specifically more for that reading of, of Schreber? And now it's more about the sarks, right? The the flesh. The thinking in terms of representations and nerves gives one the sense that one could think of these as two distinct realms. Gotcha. You know, yeah. Yeah. And they're divided by also the kinds of the people who study these things. Mm -hmm. You know, the the people who study representation are um, social scientists and humanists, and the people mm -hmm. who study the nerves are you know neuroscientists and brain anatomists. Like right. Person. Yet I think Schreber is Schreber's. I think what Sark was Schreber's sort of fleshly experience of representation that is he's experiencing the the impact of representation on his nerves that he's at a place where they overlap and the place where they overlap is in a way can't be grasped either by let's say the sciences of representation the hermeneutic sciences nor by the sciences of the brain right because we're in a different there's a new field and I think that's what psychoanalysis, that's, I think, where psychoanalysis is born at this, you know, these points of convergence between, you know, the brain and the space of meaning. Yeah, where the space of meaning has an impact on the nerves means that we're no longer talking about nerves and we're no longer talking about meaning exactly. Brilliant. Yeah. We're yeah. talking about a new kind of vibration <laughs> that. <laughs> And it's very hard to find the right language. And I think that Freud tried to invent a, a new mm -hmm. language. And he had to invent a new kind of mode of attention, a new yeah. kind of hearing, because he wasn't listening simply to meaning. And he wasn't simply listening for signs of anatomical lesions in the brain. You know, So you could say that hysterics suffered in their soma yes. something that happened in the semiotic and where those the somatic registration of let's say semiotic trouble is sarks <laughs> so it's no longer soma and can't you know the somatic and no longer simply the semantic and semiotic so we're in a new a new zone agamben likes to use the phrase you know the um the zones of what does he call it i'm blanking out on this this phrase he keeps using about this you know the zone of where they're you know of indifference um okay between you know two realms well i was just going to say um this is maybe too facile but i just think it's kind of interesting because you, you can kind of like see the nerves don't physically touch right there's a gap right. there's that gap in between them that sort of this sort of electrical circuit gets completed i don't know i think that's super interesting related to you know 
something like Lacanian, the cut, the that sort of thing. Or the bar. Right, right, right. I quote several times in various places this phrase that Rainer Maria Rilke, the poet, used when he wrote a novel, The Notebooks of Malta Lord's Brigga, published in 1910. It's an incredible novel. It's kind of the novel that I read my first year in graduate school at UT Austin and kind of, I think, set me on the path that I continued to be on. And Rilke, and as I mentioned in the book, the first time I read a passage from Malta was in Heidegger's lectures from 1929 on the fundamental problems of phenomenology, which I read in Germany in that terrible year I had. <laughs> um, again, I encountered Rilke's novel before knowing that Rilke knew a novel or okay. really very much about Rilke. Right. It's a very complicated novel. It mostly tells the story of a, a 28-year-old Danish writer from an aristocratic family that's collapsed. You know, that is interesting. So sort of the end of a, of a dynasty in a way. And he comes to Paris, he's destitute and he's trying to be a poet. And he's having a nervous breakdown, basically. He actually goes to the Salpetriere to seek psychiatric help and then runs away. But he also has these various, it's notebooks, and he, he recalls various things he read about medieval and early modern sovereigns who were failing to be sovereigns. They were undergoing crises of investiture. They were no longer able to be sovereigns. And his Polish translator said, well, what's, I don't, you know, who are these people? You know, um, how do they fit in to the novel? I don't quite, I'm, I'm tr having trouble. <laughs> and, and Rilke writes back saying, look, I don't remember everything about them. But the crucial thing is not the historical meaning. It's, it's that they and the protagonist, Malta, share the same, and he calls it the the schwingungen, the same schwingungen der Lebensintensität, the same frequencies of vital intensity. That is, they were both a Twitter. <laughs> In a certain sense, vibrating, there's a kind of vital intensity that has to do not simply with biological life, but with the discord of the flesh. Like it has its own frequencies. And Malta is undergoing, in a way, the perturbances of the flesh in his body as he wanders through Paris. And he recalls in this context various sovereigns who, in a way, collapse as the perturbances of their flesh prevents them from occupying their offices as right. sovereigns. Right. So, in a certain sense, we have a, and there, in both cases, something happening at the level of, let's say, of the symbolic of meaning, the collapse of a dynasty, the, you know, the failure to be a sovereign, live up to one's office as a sovereign, the man, the symbolic mandate has an impact on the body, but it's not exactly the body. The symptoms are, they're physical, but they're not caused by physical causes. And that's exactly what Freud first encounters with the hysteric. There are people who are suffering somatic symptoms that are not that don't have somatic causes conversion so, as he as he yeah. as he used to call it yeah. yeah so there's this whole field of experience that in a way doesn't fit that can't be assigned to the experts that were previously in charge of these you know who had the the expertise to think about and treat these you know address these domains so a new domain opens up and I would, I at some level argue in this last book is that this is the domain that's at the center of basically all the the work that we've you know since the sixties we've come to call theory. Yeah. And as you know, in the discussion before we started, you yourself said that that was crucial in this late sixties, you know, mid to late sixties and on theory was libidinal economy, and that's what Freud discovers at this point where neither, let's say, the hermeneutic sciences nor the natural sciences nor the social sciences are sufficient, that libidinal economy demands a different language, a different mode of, of attention, and that therefore it doesn't quite have a place in the university. And so it's, in a way, it's, it's all over the place. And in a certain sense, that's what's often, you know, held against it. It's all over the place, you know. Right. It's undisciplined. 
<laughs> yes, the, um, it's the indiscipline, right? Yeah. yeah. And that is because it's subject matter. It has to do with the nature of the subject matter, not a failure. It's not a failure of rigor. It's, a, it's something in the object itself. And that makes it, of course, very you know, difficult to, um, it's hard to talk about. And the language about it will by nature be speculative and somewhat, I think, poetic. That is, you'll have to, because we're trying to figure it out and literally using figures. Schreber's delusions were a kind of heroic attempt to figure it out, to figure out the Sarks, you know, to figure out his disturbance, the collapse of his symbolic mandate into his flesh. I think this is great because it, it reiterates the point you've been making throughout, which is, and also that Coop pointed out, which is that even though he does, I think, call them men of science, something like this, men of learning, at least, he's not addressing the medical, juridical, the disciplines as he is addressing metaphysicians to a certain extent, right? He is addressing the speculative thinkers who would be able to not look at his text for what it means for a certain type of disciplinary rational model, but would see sort of past that veneer, if you will, that wall of noise that might ward off the more the more traditional side, right? And he would be speaking to theorists, right? He's perhaps he's um you've coined another term. And maybe I'm not sure if, if you took this from elsewhere, but one of the terms that struck me was um was psychotheology, that like Schraber yeah. is speaking to future psychotheologians, yeah. if you will. So I would say that's why I think every generation produces new, you know, new books about Schraber and why people from so many different perspectives are drawn to Schraber. So many different disciplines are drawn to Schraber. Psychiatrists, people like, you know, Deleuze and Guattari, Friedrich Kittler, a media theorist. Yes. I mean, there's, because, you know, there are so many different, I mean, he's vibrating, you know, with this vital intensity and it's like, where is it happening? What is happening? You know, how do we characterize that? And this gets to that aspect. Uh, you kind of mentioned this in passing, but at the end of the book, you mentioned this heroic side of, of undertaking this means of, of sort of dealing, grappling with the system or symptom and systematizing it, if you will, narrativizing it. But there's a democratic gesture of Schreber to sort of let the world judge, let men of learning to come judge. And that's part of Schreber's legacy, right? That it testifies to that basic truth that he believes his text is worth dealing with and not merely just as a, as a freak show or, or some sort of parody or joke there are these kernels of truth in there yeah to some extent he wants to disseminate what he's learned about a kind of a global legitimation crisis a global demise in the bindingness of at least traditional kinds of authority he also is in a certain sense warning us that the resolution of the demise of traditional kinds of authority does not lie in transferring traditional authority to expert knowledge. Right. Because yes. he, he suffers from the impact of the experts, their manipulation of his body. So, you know, we would say, okay, yeah, we no longer believe in the, in the traditional master. We, we have now experts. Lacan calls, you know, the discourse of the university. And what Foucault argued is a kind of shift from classical sovereignty to, to biopolitical and disciplinary governmentality. And Foucault, you know, makes very clear that these new kinds of, let's say, new kinds of power agitate the body. Yes. Like, intensify it. In the yeah. body, intensify the body. And mm -hmm. Schreber is experiencing that and is saying, this is not a solution to the demise of traditional authority. It's a symptom. Yes. Of, yeah. You know, it's a, it's a symptom. It's not the cure. It's in a way part of the disease. And so it's not that we need more expert knowledge. And I think that's what, you know, Lacan and Freud are saying, we need a different kind of a new science. You know, An analytic like, discourse rather yeah. than a university discourse. Yes. Yeah. I mean, I'm surprised that Foucault never wrote in depth about Schreber. It's Just mentioned it in passing, as you said. Yeah. And because it does seem like everything is there.
you know, Foucault's work, you know, about forensic psychiatry, about the mm-hmm. history, I mean, biopower, it's in a way all there. Right. And yeah. it's because it's, it's very hard to sort out. But it is a kind of, I think if you, you know, I think reading Schreiber is like a, a good introduction to Foucault. That's, that's right? great. Yeah. I mean, I kind of assumed that you had a sort of Foucauldian method in the, just the way you kind of work through the book too, which is interesting. I think what is missing in Foucault, although it comes up here and there, is mm-hmm. that what the, the experts are addressing in the disciplines and in, let's say, biopolitical governing of populations, in a way, they don't know exactly that they're dealing with the flesh. <laughs> they're dealing with bodies and the place of bodies in social orders. In a way, the will to knowledge does not allow them to grasp what is actually attracting this knowledge. So again, it's like they could think it's the body, but it's not the body, it's the flesh, but the, the social sciences, and they don't know that. <laughs> in right. a way. And so they keep on producing, agitating the flesh while thinking they're disciplining the body, you know, managing populations. So Foucault, I think, doesn't fully grasp the, in a way the Sarxist dimension of the story he tells in the shifts from classical sovereignty to modern forms of power. That's why I think for me, you need Foucault always with psychoanalysis. Right. <laughs> um, Interesting. That they're not antagonistic, but they're complementary. Yeah, the, the strange bedfellows, or the yeah. as you say, you talk about it as a kind of soft pluralism, where you're you're not necessarily going to um, to favor or oppose, but sort of bring together this, as I like to call it, this chorus of scholarly voices that complement and boost one another instead of necessarily antagonizing. And I guess that this is, you know, it made me think of this notion of sarks of flesh, which you take from from Paul. I mean, Coop mentioned that earlier. I couldn't help but think that you were also kind of punning on on Marxism, Sarxism, yeah. but that may just be a happy coincidence. But in any case, it made me think of an anti-Oedipus in chapter three when they go through their sort of ethnographic, genealogical story of the rise of the Urstadt and the different territorial machines. It made me think of the what they call the primitive territorial machine, which is about bringing together the sort of this triangulation on the marking of bodies, planting flags and bodies, this theater of cruelty, of, of inscription. And I guess the other part, which I'm now probably going to totally mess up, but but Guattari in the Machine Unconscious has this footnote that's kind of contentious because, you know, as you know, Deleuze and Foucault were always on friendly terms and uh, collaborated in different ways, for example, in getting Nietzsche published in French in a collected edition. But Watery brings out that his, the difference he tries to suss out between Foucault and himself, or we could even say here, as you mentioned, Foucault and psychoanalysis is Foucault's emphasis on pleasure, whereas for Watery, his emphasis has always been on this role of desire. And perhaps that's, that is, they're not necessarily, again, opposed, but they're complementary, having both of those aspects and, and at least focusing on both of those with equal weight can help to bring out this dimension that you're describing, right? As the flesh, that's not merely what somatic materialism, which I believe you said is right. Terry Eagleton's right. phrase, but that, yeah. that it has to have this dimension of desire or of the drive of, I forget, uh, Coop, if you look down, I forget what it's called. What is it? Is it the drive signification i should know the this. drive dimension of signification thank you right. thank you yeah. yes you believe this is perhaps that missing element that psychoanalysis can help to complement yes yes another way i've been thinking of it is and this may lead too far afield but it has to do with what i've called psychotheology the way freud talks about the drive and particularly and even more the way lacan talks about the drive mm-hmm. resonates it's as if negative theology. With the death of God, what happens is the negative theology becomes subjectivized, becomes interesting. So the orbiting around the unnameable, you can't grasp God through his predicates. So you're constantly orbiting around this unnameable dimension. And in a certain sense, that's how Lacan, and to some extent Freud, characterizes drive, this, this constant encircling of an impossible object. And so 
it's as if apophantic theology has become psychological. Interesting. You know, yeah. For me, and I'll also let Coop join in because we have discussed the drive, specifically Freud's, I think his most concrete attempt to discuss the drive or at least in um, instincts and their vicissitudes, where he tries to at least break down the four components, right? Pressure, aim, object, source. And one of the elements of this negative theology, this, the, the apophantic, as you're pointing it out with Freud, at least, is when he talks about, about the source as the psychical representative of the drive. But he's basically saying that's not our field, that's the field of the life sciences, of biology, and perhaps they'll have something more to say, but that's kind of where, for Freud, he's not necessarily, at least in that work, going to speculate or go beyond that limit that he sets for himself. So that's, that's to me, where one of those elements of, you know, as for the source, it's bodily, whatever, but that's not our our domain. And I, I wonder if that's an aspect of some of what you're talking about. One of the ways that I find helpful of thinking about basically all of my work has been like a um, kind of an attempt to understand what makes us work. Really at some level about work. I've always found it fascinating that for Freud, everything is a kind of work. There's Mm -hmm. the work of mourning. There's the dream work. Dream work, yeah. Working through. And and working through. And he calls the drive a demand for work. Right. By the unthoughtable coming from within whatever the drive is, it's a demand for work. And he says, we don't really know what a drive is, but it's a, in a way, it's a demand for work, but it's not exactly purpose of work. Purpose. Yes. And this is the thing. This is the crucial thing. So unconscious mental activity is elaborating, is working under a demand that Mm -hmm. is enigmatic. So in a certain sense, you know, when someone is acting out, someone is OCD, someone is repeating the same stupid mistakes, you say, what are you doing? And like, why are you doing that? In a certain sense, at some level, they don't know. Yes. And even if you give all kinds of interpretations and they say, yes, that's why, it's not it exactly. And just in the same way, negative theology says goodness, omnipotence, all these things is not it. So there's something unnameable that is being elaborated in the drive. And I guess the question is, is there a way to, in a way, respond to this demand that is not enslaving, that doesn't destroy our sense of freedom, that we could be driven without being compulsive? The idea that we could convert repetition compulsion into a kind of driven creativity. And so that the demand for work, which is a kind of keeps your body busy. And this is where I start linking it to Marx and the demand, you know, capital's demand for always, you know, the self-valorization of value. It never yes. stops demanding work. And for me, the promise of, you know, theory is somehow grasping how to work differently and maybe even to come up with, and I don't think the alternative of work and play is sufficient, but there's just some, a different understanding of the vita activa that is not working off an impossibility, an impossible demand, and yet not disavowing the impossible demand. Interesting. Um, Because there's a void there, but not trying to simply convert an impossible demand into a you know translated into a re- seemingly reasonable demand right something okay i could do that so there's some way of living with the pressure of the drive that doesn't turn it into a task a project right that is as if you could discharge that demand through an achievement, an accomplishment. Mm. So I think that the problem has to do with the proximity of the demand for work of the drive and the superego. You're not doing enough. Work harder. Do more. You're not busy. What are you doing? You lazy. <laughs> Come on. You yes, know. yes, so sense, yes. There's something about the way that the drive, the, what Freud called the demand for work that is the drive, that is not simply somatic, a demand of the somatic, and yet it seems to come from within. And 
there's a proximity of, and what I want to say is it has to do with a kind of a, a gap, a void, a not working that in a way could be shared. So in a way, the ultimate commons is in a certain sense, the sharing of this void that we avoid by, in a way, enslaving other, you know, by getting others to do the work <laughs> or by working ourselves to death or, you know, but there's some way in which this translation of a pressure into a demand for more work and Freud in a way never gets, is so yes. caught up in the language of work that it often becomes hard to distinguish the drive from the superego. So what wants us to work? You know, what is it that wants, that is demanding all this work? And is there a way to disengage from it? You know, rather than the Bartleby, I prefer not to work, you know. Yeah. So that's one very common, you know, that's cited by many theorists, you know, from Deleuze to Agamben and, and Zizek and other, the Bartleby solution, I prefer not to. Okay, but that's, you know, there's something just very disappointing <laughs> in the Bartleby solution. So there has to be something between Bartleby and Ahab. You know? Yes, <laughs> I'm just, I like um, that. I think that's kind of what everyone who, you know, who works in this domain, who's thinking in this domain is after. And clearly the capitalist organization of work is, I want to say, is a one mode of management of this management yeah, yes yeah. of this of a demand for work that's yes. not that has nothing to do with human needs or even exactly desires paul's problem i don't want this but something in me wants it and so how do you engage with that that demand you know without let's say simply trying to manage the symptoms let's say through pharmacology or through finding just, you know, just, okay, accepting it. I have to do more. Be busier. Get your body, make your body busier. Become a busier body. So I think that all of this, all of these things that we've been talking about, in some sense, converge on this, this problem of something is demanding to be elaborated, but not exactly in projects. <laughs> and so it may be that just different forms of human expressivity and yeah. creativity, different practices can elaborate this demand without, in a way, I, I want to say creating in institutions and machines that, yeah. that in a way capitalize on it. So gotcha. it's in a certain sense, yeah. Yeah. Like yeah. the problem of like, we need to capitalize on it. So it's a kind of, you know, I think that's, you know, Bataille is, you know, the idea of expenditure, mm -hmm. free expenditure. There's something there. Useless that, expenditure, yeah. right. So I think he, this is kind of what he's, what he was onto, but I, it's in a language that I, I just don't, don't fully relate to. <laughs> but I think that, you know, the problem of work or discharging, what are we doing when we work? That's not simply a purposeful. And sometimes we could say it's expressive, but other times we say it's just, it's obsessive. I still remember I, when I was in graduate school, I worked in a restaurant and, you know, I worked in the kitchen and I remember, you know, all the restaurant work, they were all, you know, artists, students, and we had wonderful conversations. And I remember one of them ended up being about the difference between passion and compulsion. Mm, that's interesting. How do you tell the difference between your passions and your passion, you're doing something out of passion and you're doing something out of compulsion. And I think that's still, you know, I remember the conversation, you know, it was in the early 80s in a restaurant in Texas, in Austin, Texas. And it never, it bugged me that I couldn't tell myself yeah. sometimes whether I was doing something out of passion, passion or out of, because I felt compelled to do it. And in a way, you're doing work in both cases. Interest, Yeah. Um, yeah. You're doing something in both cases. You're active, but they're very different. But yes. sometimes very hard. To, they often could feel you sometimes don't know the difference. Two immediate responses, and I'll let uh, 
Coop jump in after, but one, this made me think of, we had a conversation last week with Grant Maxwell uh, about Spinoza, this problem of a sort of freedom of choice or freedom of the mind, but a determinism of the will, right? This kind of crystallizes, I think, that that passion and compulsion part of your argument. And, and as we know, Spinoza kind of worked himself to death grinding his lenses. But the other part was your essay on, on monotheism, which I read before reading Untying Things Together, ends with, I guess it's in one of uh, Kafka's notebooks. Yeah. I couldn't fully place it in that essay, but seeing it at the end of the epilogue, at the end of the book, with this theme of hammering, right? Uh, this thing of whether it be Nietzsche philosophizing with a hammer and sounding out idols, obviously Heidegger's Zuhandenheit, Vorhandenheit, but in that relation with Kafka talking about sort of hammering away. As if doing nothing. As if doing right. nothing. It made a lot, it actually came very crystal clear at the end of your book. That was my immediate response in your sort of elaboration of this tension that perhaps Kafka is trying to get it, again, it's something perhaps indescribable, but he's trying to get at this, this notion of hammering away as though he were doing nothing, but ha still hammering crazier, right? Yeah. Uh, more mean, intensely. And it, it is. That's why I end the book with that, because it's, I don't fully know what he means, but it sounds like <laughs> if we knew what he meant, we'd really grasp something profound about mm -hmm. human life. It's a little bit like at some point, Walter Benjamin said, if we, whoever grasps the nature of, of humor in Kafka will hold the key to his work. Amazing. And, and I think it's like <laughs> this passage from a diary entry, that if we could grasp this diary entry, we will have, it's like a paradigm shift. In yeah. our understanding of the mind and the body and why we do what we do and what alternatives there are. And he says, yeah, he said, he said, you know, at the end, he says, this hammering is a nothingness to him. But he says, no, it's not that. This hammering is really a hammering to him, yet at the same time, it is also a nothingness, whereby the hammering would have become still bolder, still more resolute still more real and if you will still crazier and that's kind of like okay that's it mm -hmm. it sounds like a kind of performance art and i almost want to say it's as if a john cagey kind of performance art but i don't think it's been produced yet and it's almost like i'm trying to Im imagine that which means trying to un that i think to understand what he means in a certain sense you have to do it in some way yeah it's a kind of practice. And I think that's a, the other aspect of the title, Untying Things Together, is that you can't do it alone. It has to be done in, in a certain sense in concert with others. So this hammering, I think, is a kind of uh, practice, a, a social practice. That's not exactly how Kafka imagines it, but I think that's part of continuing the work, uh, this thought experiment. In the quote, though, doesn't he say something as though there is an audience or spectators looking on? Uh, or, or am I reading that into it? If you would. Yeah, it's like it, someone is, yeah, someone is, is looking. Yeah. So, that so there is, there is a kind of implied is, togetherness. Yes, yes, even yes. If, if there's it, an audience. It is like yes. he's, it's, it, it is like a performance piece. Yes. Yes. I think you said that very well. And, uh, I really appreciated that. And because uh, I was thinking about Kafka earlier when you were talking about negative theology and the drive and something unnameable, it reminded me a little bit, this call to work of the drive reminded me a little bit about your reading of the metamorphosis in my own private Germany. There is, there is this call to work, but, you know, Gregor Samson can't, he can't heed the call, right? He, he's, he's transformed into something unworkable. But um, but there there here there's an alternative between you know be, to becoming a, a cockroach or a dung beetle or whatever, <laughs> and again it's also not Bartleby he's hammering, but it's in a certain sense it's hammering without I would say it's work it's like a, a fantasy of work without super ego. That's right. It's both and, useful yet it's nothing so it's potentially creative and useless in that. Again, that, that expenditure kind of, of sense. I'm not sure useless is exactly the word. I mean, 
I think that, you know, this is why Agamben keeps on invoking this problem, a different use. Uh, okay. A okay. different use of bodies. But again, Agamben just invokes it. He'll actually quote Kafka or Benjamin with some enigmatic passage like the one I use, although he never uses this one. But there is some sense in that we're talking about a different, that this theory is, that theory is always an attempt to imagine a new kind of praxis, a new kind of, of use of, I love that. of our bodies. It's not that theory gets converted into praxis. It's that theory is always about a new kind of practice or the way Agamemnon says a new use of bodies, which means a shift in our libidinal economy. How do you provoke a shift at that level, which is not exactly an intellectual shift, a conceptual shift? It's something that we, you know, yeah. I mean, I think it's something that involves our fantasy, you know, our fantasy lives, our desires. Our, so it's really, it may be just utopian, you know, to even imagine these kinds of interventions, these kinds of changes. But it seems like it's, I feel like there's no choice but to try to think this. It's utopian in the sense of Adreska, right? It's uh, in the way the Adreska sciences that you imagine. It's, it's, Right, Odredek, the... Odredek, yeah. Oh, Odredek, sorry. Right. I, I edit that out, Coop. <laughs> <laughs> oh, the, the Odredek studies are sciences that you, one of the, the wild signifying readings is Odredek is kind of no place, right? It's a kind of utopia. Right, right. yeah, without it, with no address. Adre- od- adresse, yeah, yeah. I like that. Listen, I actually have to have to go. That's totally acceptable. We have kept you for two hours. And I think that we had a very exciting conversation. And, and I actually think this is a great place to, to stop because you wrap up so nicely. So whether you were intentionally doing that or yeah. whether you were hammering away as though, uh, <laughs> as though hammering away at nothing, I think that that's a perfect stoppage point for us. And Eric, I just, I can't express how much we are really appreciated. Uh, well, this, I really enjoyed this. And yeah, yeah I, I mean, I really, this felt really productive and fruitful for me. Oh, nice. Awesome. Excellent. Yeah. And it, just, just for us. And of course we could have a million other things to say and we barely scratched the surface of your oeuvre, but I just think it was wonderful to have you. And uh, if you would give us just 30 seconds more are you working on anything at the moment? If any future plans, or are you are you sort of rereading and just sort of enjoying your your time after this recent publication? I'm actually trying to. Um, I've mentioned that there are several, there are a number of, of books and authors I keep trying and then failing to. Well, one of them is the novel "The Man Without Qualities." Robert okay. Kiyos, you know this thousand page fragment. <laughs> it's never, it's you know he never finished it. And I've gotten to various places and then given up in the book. And I've started it again. And I'm actually, for the first time, actually enjoying it. But okay. it, and it ultimately, and it's, there are many levels to it. One of it takes place in 1913, just before World War I, and it's right. about the collapse of the Austro Hungarian Empire, but ultimately the dispersion of traditional kinds of authority okay. into a multiplicity of, discourses and language games that don't that are are kind of adrift like clouds that semantic clouds you know word clouds floating signifiers no meta narrative (laughs) yes so it is very much i think that leotard's description of the postmodern condition is at some level a reading of the man without qualities wonderful and i'm trying now to um you know to get into it and yeah. there's actually one of the things he, a term he uses in the novel is Möglichkeitssinn, which is the sense of possibility. Oh, Möglichkeit like is possibility and Zinn is sense, mm-hmm. but it's also, you know, the way in English as well, sense is connected to the sensuous. Right. And so I want to say that I'm trying to think of, of the notion of Möglichkeit, Sinnlichkeit which mm. is the sensuousness of possibility, of the sense I of like possibility. It. And that sexuality, mm, yeah. the way Freud thinks of sexuality, is where we, where we encircle the possibility of new possibilities of the use of our bodies. 
And that's built in as he kind of argues in the three essays, right? Because you did yeah. you did say you are wanting to write this three essays yeah. of the sexuality of theory. So this is kind of a continuation of that thread that But I want to do it use, you know, through again, not <laughs> pure theory or philosophy. Yes, yes. Through exegesis, you know, yeah. a kind of an exegetical sort of philosophy as exegesis. I like it. Yeah. I like it. Well, we will, uh, you've been very generous with your time and oh, yeah. Eric, I think this is, this is wonderful. And of course, open invitation. We'll have to have you back perhaps sometime in the new year. We'll have you back. And, and there's so much more we can discuss. I didn't get to ask. Well, Cooper and I both had plenty of other questions. So, <laughs> so we will keep those saved and, um, this episode should drop in two weeks and I will send you a note when it comes out. And, um, and we're just, again, we're so very happy to have you today. Thank you, guys. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank so you, Eric. Okay. Very much enjoyed have a good it. weekend. You too. You too. Thank you. Okay, bye. Bye. And that will wrap up this week's edition of the Machinic Unconscious Happy Hour with Cooper Cherry and Taylor Atkins. Of negativity and singularity, including the ultimate form of singularity, which is unconscious. The world of Violence without object and This is the typical violence of information. It's violent because what happens there is a murder of the real, the vanishing point of reality. Let's not have a misunderstanding here. With nothing left but recycled, whitewashed, lobotomized people, as in a block work orange.